Hi. It is so wonderful to contribute to the initiative Canto per Canto Conversations with Dante in Our Time. We are speaking from the Georgia Augusta University in Göttingen in northern Germany. The place won't sound familiar to many of you. However, at the end of the 19th century, the former American president Theodore Roosevelt visited Göttingen and fell in love with the many wonderful trees in and outside the small city. At least this is what you may read in the most uh, sophisticated guidebooks about Göttingen. The tree seemed to have fostered in Roseville the idea of introducing the concept of national parks in the US in order to preserve the beautiful landscapes and extraordinary sites of nature. Indeed, they can tell us amazing things about the long evolution of our planet that took place long before humankind would come into being. Now a word to ask the two speakers of this Lectura Dantes in Purgatory 28. Next to me, that means on the other screen, you see Manuel Möll, my assistant, who is writing a PhD on modern Italian poetry and the issue of aesthetical experience. He's also interested in Dante, of course. Thank you very much for this introduction and hello. Um, I first became aware of Dante through my school days in Italy and the lectures of Professor Meyer, of course. Um, and I'm very pleased that Francisca Meyer is a Dante scholar and teaches Dante as well as the reception of Dante on a regular basis. Even though she has not given a class on Dante's purgatory yet, I was eager to talk with her about the subject. So this is a kind of new territory for the both of us. But Let's cut right to the chase. Uh, we are on the top of Mount Purgatory that Dante reached after a long and strenuous climb up to seven terraces on which the seven capital sins are purged in quite a horrendous way. To start with, shouldn't we take a look at the famous fresco by Domenico Michelino in the Florence Cathedral? That is a classical representation of purgatory. At the bottom, you see those who still await that the huge angel let them begin with the purge. Then you see the terraces set, and on top, a kind of forest surrounded by a fire that is supposed to clean you from the excesses of love. However, what you do not see on the fresco is that Virgil crowned the pilgrim Dante and the Canto before. What do we make out of this? It is pretty blunt to be crowned by one of the leading poets of the ages after having repented for the sin of superbia and to be declared free of any wrong desire. I guess this is one of the spots where the divine comedy really becomes the great story it is. Dante is homo novus. And speaking about the storytelling, as we enter Canto 28, we are confronted again with a foresta, this time, however, with a divine one that oversprays with life, spessa, eviva, At the same time, the canto is slowed down. Dante takes his time to marvel the view of the garden and its variety of plants that only grow here and whose seeds are sometimes blown to the earth. What a great idea that all facets of the nature in which we live, and even more than that, are present, present in this very place, as if our earth had a matrix here on top of the mountain on which we can always fall back. Yes, you're right. It is a marvelous description. Sometimes I feel like being lifted into quite another place. Anyhow, it is interesting that Dante explicitly links this marvelous place to that in the first canto of the comedy. You remember, there we have a dense forest as well, in which Dante, however, gets lost and so utterly depressed that he would have died if he had not seen the promising light on top of the mountain. And if he had not met Virgil, who showed him the way through hell and purgatory. Now we are again in the deep forest. Among these parallels, there's one feature I'm still puzzling about. The fact that the wood in the first canto is dark is not surprising. But why the divine wood in the Garden Eden is so dark too? Every time I read the country, I cannot help imagining a bright springtime with many lovely colors. 
yet the river lies in the dark. Dante the poet says in line 32 and 33, dark under the perpetual shade which never lets sun or moon shine through. So runs Darling's and Martina's translation. So we have to imagine the Garden Eden as a place without sunlight. The parallels show that at this point of the comedy, we have come full circle. Dante is finally there where he had hoped he arrived in the first canto, that is 77 cantos earlier. Virgil has done his job and in our canto, for the first time, he walks behind Dante through the exciting piece of nature. And also in the Michelino fresco, we get a clue that this forest crossed by a lovely river is the Garden of Eden. However, don't you think that Michelino's depiction is highly deceiving? In Dante, we do not meet Adam and Eve placed next to a tree in the Divine Comedy. The pilgrim rather comes across a beautiful girl. We learn her name, Matilda, much later. It is kind of puzzling how Dante stages a Garden of Eden from which Adam and Eve had been chased and that is still there but surprisingly has an inhabitant that the Bible does not mention. She is there somehow just for Dante. On a different topic, however, we encounter a lot of references to water that flows undisturbed through Eden. And I imagine this for a second. Nature as far as the eye can see and the life spending source of water in between. This is a view that today one rarely finds since a large part of nature these days shows traces of human civilization, even in our national parks. Um, without the paths created in the national parks, we wouldn't be able to find our way around. Dante meets Matelda, the only person in Eden to help him and explain the ways of this level of purgatory mountain to him. But the area is untouched by mankind, so to speak. And yet Matelda is there right in the middle. So I ask myself, does she take care of the park? Yes, and I have been also wondering about whether she is a human being at all. What we read in the commentaries is far from being clear. We learn, for instance, that Matilda is one of the usual suspects, such as Francesca da Rimini, Ugolino, and Ulisse. She is very vivid and personal, someone we may almost identify with. Her peers, indeed, used to have an historical or mythical counterpart. In her case, this does not seem to be the case. What about Matilda of Canossa? Dante must have heard of her, at least vaguely. Yes, I know. There has been a controversy about it. However, I think there's no real clue in the text that Dante wants us to think of Matilda of Canossa. Actually, why on earth should we find a powerful lady in the Garden of Eden, a Virgo who supported the Pope in his fight against the Roman Emperor? Matilda of Canossa, as you know, is connected to one of the most humiliating episodes in the medieval fight between the Pope and the Emperor. I guess we then have to assume that Matilda is closer to an allegory than a personification but an allegory of what? Beatrice seems to be an allegory of theology, of the divine love, and Matilda? Matilda probably is closer to an allegory than to a real person. Yet she's so charming, so humane. I do not feel like identifying her with a mere personification. Maybe we should rather shift to how Dante describes the encounter. You have recently mentioned the striking atmosphere that is evoked at the beginning of the canto, the slowing down. It is for Dante the pilgrim and for the reader a moment of relax, I think. He seems to be at peace with what surrounds him. It is a slowing down, but is, is it really a moment of relaxation? Um, I think we as readers perceive Dante's desire to join Matilda through the marvel he feels watching her dancing steps and the flowers surrounding her. Again, he's curious. He wants to cross the river. He does not suffer. Yes, that is the relaxation, but he is still driven by a powerful desire and finds himself in front of a barrier or frontier, such as the river. There's a lot of dynamic going on in the canto, isn't it? I think so, too. 
And it reminds me of an aspect I've always loved in Matilda, the way she picks the flowers and she dances. It's very close to a particular feature in Renaissance paintings that the art historian Abi Warburg pointed out. It is the figure of a young, beautiful girl who enters the scene carrying water on her head and does not correspond to any historical character, nor is she connected to the unfolding of the depicted scene. Scholars have been wondering why Warburg did not take Dante's Matilda as a model into account. I think Dante was aware of a telling slight difference between Matilda and the dynamic Renaissance girl. Indeed, there is something particular about Matilda's dancing. She moves full of grace, but she does not move out of the spot where she is. It is true, most of the readers, including me, figure out a dance, a dynamic. But if you read the lines closely, Matilda's movements are altered or in suspense. It is difficult to explain the paradox of a movement that does not move forward. So do you mean that Dante's description squares the circle? Couldn't this be linked to the aspect we spoke about at the beginning? This colorful garden of Eden that is actually a place in the dark because the sun and moon are not able to cross the dense foliage of the divine wood. And wouldn't this fit with Dante's decision not only to get into the earthly paradise, but also to figure out an inhabitant who still lives there? Wouldn't this match with the fact that Matilda is neither... Uh, historical character nor an allegory. Let's say she's just created by God, but did not have to leave Eden. Why not? In any case, uh, she's a girl who never became a woman and never experienced any suffering nor strong feelings. She lives her desire without fear and without sin. By the way, this has been quite a shock, mostly for early American dentisti who had a hard time tackling with what they call the erotic undercurrent of the scene. For instance, look at line 57. Why does Matilda cast her eyes down to earth like a virgin is supposed to do? If she is without desire, why make Dante, why does Dante make her behave according to the medieval code of customs? Does it mean that the poet Dante could not figure out female innocence outside the social rules and cliches of his time? I suppose Matilda is a challenge for Dante as well as for us, the reader. She reminds me of the 60s when some women put on miniskirts and were surprised, if not shocked, when a man responded on erotic or even sexual terms. So if we go back to Matilda within the paradise again, uh, we do not know anything about her relationship with Adam and Eve. Shouldn't we understand Matilda as something artificial, the product of Dante's attempt to undo or reverse the fall? from the Garden of Eden. As the pilgrim manages to re-enter the Garden of Eden as the first living human being after Adam and Eve, so Matilda, and this is fancy before as well, managed somehow to stay out of history, out of the passing of time. And another question could be what comes out of this bizarre encounter. We know that the pilgrim dungeons ends up falling back on us and into history. Therefore, he does not step out of time and history. I would say it's all about art. Art is the place where Matilda and Dante, the poet, as well as the pilgrim meet. All these striking, contradictory features may sum up to the idea that it is only art in which what is unthinkable can be figured out and experienced. Just to make sure, do you mean that the last part of the canto in which Matilda speaks about the golden age as it is described by the ancient pagan poets is not only a proud appreciation of pagan poetry that comes very close to the biblical representation of the Garden of Eden? 
this would be a good point. Our country would turn out to consecrate an art that is able to pass borders, to imagine things that Dante does not want us to see as mere whimsical inventions, but as a serious anticipation of things placed outside of our human world. The canto, then, would show the extent to which poetical words have the power to represent what is beyond human grasp. I agree, indeed. Couldn't we say that the entire canto is an experiment in poetically or aesthetically triggered sensations? The depiction of color is so striking that you forget the lines mentioning the profound darkness of the place. The dancing is so pleasant and dynamic that you forget about Matilda's being standstill. Doesn't the canto teach us a lesson what poetry can trigger in the reader's mind? And this fascinating line of interpretation nicely matches with the connections to Inferno 16 and Inferno 17, that is to the description of the monster Gerione who challenges Dante's poetry and claim of sincerity. You suddenly remember Gerione's torso that is so colorful and bright, although there's no godly sun to make it shine. We know that colors are considered as symbols of deceit unless they are produced by light. In the Garden of Eden, we are again in a colorful green place and again, there's not much light. Yet, now everything is different. It is as if this moment of relax opens a space in which art, artful proceedings are at their best and can be used without any fear, nor any caveat. I think it's a great moment of art, yeah. But also a great moment of nature, showing not only why what untouched nature looked like for Dante, but showing us an inspired, aspiring goal to achieve. We need to preserve and renaturalize the world we live in, with some of the plants and animals disappear through human expansion. Future generations, generations will thank us. And I thank you for the inspiring um, conversation. Thank you thank too. You.